So there is a belief in, and many people in the Tibetan world and amongst our supporters who say that actually, you know, the Tibet movement, Tibetans, we've tried nonviolence. Um, we've tried it all these decades and it hasn't worked. And it's time for new strategies, new tactics, and a new approach because we're not making progress. Um, what do you say to that? Well, in a freedom struggle like ours, which took now almost about 60 years, and uh, we are not quite there, it is, it is quite natural for any you know, people in the struggle when they look at a larger picture, we haven't achieved, you know, uh, we have tried non-violence and people are not giving that kind of attention. It is, it's quite normal. Um, mm -hmm. And many uh, people in different struggles, they feel that way. But if you actually look at a larger picture and look at this, this stretch of 60 years of resistance from Chinese invasion in 1949 uh, and then 59 when Isolinists leave and undergoing all this time, we have actually achieved a great amount of this and we have laid a very strong base for the freedom movement. When, when Tibetans, for example, when they first came into India in 1959, they were looking at uh, the trains and the buses and the cars mm. in India as, 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 as a miracle they, because they were coming out of uh, the isolation Tibet mm. uh, to a completely new, uh, uh, new era. And from there we look at today, we have a democracy. We have the exile government. People inside Tibet are, uh, you know, never before so strong, powerful, united, politically awakened. You know, so we have come a long way, and and yet at the same time we have much more to achieve, and there is a whole future, and so much of scope to move forward, look forward to. Yeah, I think um, <coughs> one one thing that kind of stands out in our movement is, you know, the approach with which, the world view with which we look at nonviolence and nonviolent action. It's a very Buddhist oriented kind of way of looking at nonviolence as a discipline that we must maintain, but not necessarily as a weapon that we can wield mm. in order to fight our opponent. And uh, I think that's where, uh, when we look at the Tibet movement, uh, from a tactical perspective, we have been using so many of the tactics that come under the category of protest and persuasion in the way that you know the pioneering theorist Gene Sharp has defined them. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's street marches, rallies, vigils, prayers, speeches, uh, flyers, you know, so many of these things that we have been so successful at doing, they come under that particular category. However, I think. Um, in terms of other movements and other countries that have been successful in achieving their democracy and freedom through nonviolence. If we look at them, the critical moment for them actually came not when they were using so many of those similar tactics, but when they made the move into civil disobedience, non-cooperation, mm -hmm. uh, direct intervention. And that's something we can see in many other movements. So I think for the Tibet movement, uh, thankfully now we are beginning to see a little bit more of those tactics, whether inside Tibet, uh, we're seeing you know, boycott, non-cooperation, and that's a very interesting uh, place to be in right now. And if we look at all these uh, 198 some documented tactics, what we have used so far, they come to, you know, one time we started counting, they come to around 37 or 40 percent of the documented mm -hmm. tactics, so there is still so much ground that we have yet to cover. Yeah, and I think the one thing that's so obvious um, to us, certainly to me as I look at our struggle, is that we have engaged in a lot of activities that, um, you know, awareness raising, other activities that felt right, that we did because of principle, that we know we just had to do this protest or that thing, but actually in order for us to be effective and in order for us to really make change uh, especially on the ground inside Tibet the key with strategic nonviolence or active nonviolence we actually need to do a lot more planning mm -hmm. a lot more analysis of what tactics to use when and where mm -hmm. and how and we need to be more clear about what exactly we're trying to achieve you know the goal of every uh, the ultimate goal for us is of course freedom and human rights um, for Tibetans but 
but in the individual campaigns that we wage and the way that we do things, there are interim goals, there's short-term mm -hmm. goals that we need to be thinking about. <coughs> You know, how do we um, increase the cost for the Chinese government in Tibet or in the world, socially, politically, economically? Mm -hmm. How do we sequence our um, campaigns and, and, and the tactics that we use so mm -hmm. that we're escalating pressure yeah. and so that we're driving up, you know, the, um, the pressure on the regime and, you know, in the certain right moments or in the right ways? There's so much more that we can be doing. If we thought about creating an active and rigorous resistance struggle, like a, you know, truly one that makes it untenable for China to hold on to Tibet, um, then you know we obviously have a lot more work to do. And I think probably now we're we're just coming to this place where um, where we're ready for that in a way. Mm. We've we've worked, we've built, a, gained a lot of ground. We've kept the struggle alive. Tibetans are, are as Tundula mm. said, strong and awakened and perhaps more united than ever before in our history. Mm. And now is the time um, for us to take the movement up, the struggle up many levels in terms of, you know, it's nonviolent, but in terms of the, the war-like uh, mentality that we can have when we think about uh, defeating the opponent. And one of the challenges in the uh, Tibetan uh, freedom struggle mm -hmm is to really understand the Buddhist Tibetan and also mm -hmm. the, the political Tibetan. You know, the Buddhist Tibetan looks for nirvana, which is the end goal of, uh, you know, Buddhist practice. Mm -hmm. At the same time, being the political Tibetan, you want a reasonably independent uh, freedom uh, for Tibet and mm -hmm. the Tibetan people, as all 190 odd number of countries <coughs> around the world, you know a sense of justice and a country uh, and that, that we run ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that way, uh, if we keep measuring our activities from this very mm -hmm. Buddhist principle, then we are unable to do anything. If you have anger in your, in your heart, it's considered violent. You uh, speak, uh, counter or expose Chinese atrocities in Tibet, it's considered violent because they'll be hurt. So we need to see mm. reasonably how to be political, uh, nonviolent. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi, Gandhiji is, is a very good example who is very spiritual at the same time political. Mm. He's spiritual personally and he encourages everybody to be truthful, which is the spiritual practice. At the same time, he's confrontational where there is need to expose, where there is need to confront violence, mm. when, when they need to confront your adversary, he does it, he stands and he, he receives the beating, mm. he goes to jail, uh, yeah. he encourages millions of other people to do the same civil rights movement and he led the freedom struggle um, of India to, to this level. Mm. So, so there is much more yeah. to do you, you mentioned Nirvana and I, I want to make sure no one understands that we, or at least I, uh, am against Nirvana, you know. <laughs> I would take Nirvana any any time, <laughs> any day. I'm but a big fan. Nirvana. I'm a big fan not of Nirvana. <laughs> um, but I think you know that's the difference between salvation and liberation. Salvation can free one person at a time, while liberation can free all. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, and clearly, obviously, that's why we seek liberation. And I think to that end, one way of looking at nonviolence is something that is not just a shield but also a sword. Mm. So that we are not only playing defense all the time, we are also playing offense, you know. So with a new kind of, new way of looking at nonviolent resistance and nonviolent weapons, I think we should uh, seek to go into the battle with both our shield and our sword.